Thanks for listening to another episode of the Gifted Performance Podcast. If you're listening or watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, as well as hitting the like button and the notification bell so you never miss a video. If you prefer audio format, search Gifted Performance on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting service and subscribe today. Make sure you also rate and review the podcast as that helps us out tremendously. Enjoy the podcast and stay gifted. All right, folks, welcome back. Another episode, another Q&A episode of the GPP, the Gift of Performance podcast, where we give you the knowledge, practical takeaways, and all that good stuff to improve your own general physical preparedness. That was the sound of my speaker shutting off. Do you hear that? I got this Bluetooth speaker, and it, if you don't like play sound through it for like 30 seconds, it's like, all right, fuck you. I'm off. I'm off. I'm done. None of us heard it. None of us give a shit. Perfect. Even better. All right. What are some things that you do give a shit about these days, guys? Paul, what are you what have you been giving a shit about? Very little. <laughs> Very <laughs> fucking little. <laughs> like so little, it's gonna take me a minute, dude. All right. You know, we'll circle back. Jay, 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 what do you what do you give a shit about? Do you give a shit about GoDaddy's support team? <laughs> Shout outs to GoDaddy for being a, such a wonderful team. I think they actually work for us now, um, under me. Yeah. But uh, yeah, shout outs to GoDaddy. I just got back from vacation, so it feels good to feel like I can care about something again. Because like we've talked about before, I started to hit, you know, my work MRV. Shout outs to Dr. My. I really started to hit. I was almost there. Um, so and I decided that, I, I, you know, maybe I need to resensitize myself to work volume. So I just took a little bit of time off, two weeks to uh, resensitize myself. And now I'm going to accrue more volume, work volume. <laughs> over the next four to six weeks um and taper back down maybe take a maintenance phase in between there just to kind of let the work really seep into my brain um and then kind of go from there do you think that like enhancements like maybe like adderall vivance the drugs of those would artificially increase your 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 work volume ceiling so that you could actually do even more volume there I think that's oh. kind of like taking like those those painkillers, the the really bad <laughs> ones that bodybuilders took to where they felt like nothing back in the day. What not, then, not at all? Then you, not huh? at all on those things. I think that was a, a swelling agent. But uh the, uh the Dorian Yates compound, right? He was a big fan of that. You can yeah. you can jerk your barbell rows like a complete moron and slip as many discs as you want if you don't feel it was pain. it's all good. Something, brother. Something Bane, right? New Bane? New, New Bane. Bane. New Bane. Yeah. Nice. That was nice. it. Dom, we're not done. What are you what are you been giving a shit about lately? I'm having a kid. <laughs> yeah, of course you are. Yeah, life got real. <laughs> real quick. <laughs> it snuck up on him. And he just oh. got jumped by life. You can see the fatigue starting to set in. Get oh, you're in the like I feel like I'm the type of dude that like you should just be able to look at me and right after you ask like what do you give a shit about you're like oh I shouldn't ask that like <laughs> probably probably not I think there's like very little anybody can say to me these days that like really like like sends me over the edge you know like people are like dude you're wearing a nose strip look at your hair I'm like yeah this that's hurts it me. it is what it is Except all of this this is me <laughs> <laughs> all right let's get into some questions here our first one is a doozy it came in late last night or the night before i don't remember people dm me things at weird times at night it was from michelle martin uh, michelle asks at mamartin.05 uh, michelle asks theoretically someone on hrt hormone replacement therapy carry a lower body fat percentage all the time because of the continuous replacement of hormones paul is on HRT, so I think he can speak to this directly. Paul, would you say that your HRT allows you to maintain a lower body fat than you would have without? Is that does that theory hold water? It really doesn't seem like it, or like like it did. But I'll tell you, early on, like after some time, like maybe a year or two or so, I think I uh, started to notice that the the shape of my body fat like where i store body fat did start to shift just a little bit just a little bit nothing major nothing huge probably just something that like only i could really see or if like i pointed it out in like photos from like a few years earlier or something 
Uh, to clarify, what is what is your HRT regimen that you get from your doctor? Um, I'm prescribed 200 milligrams of testosterone, um, a milligram and a half of anastrol a week that I don't take, and then like 500 or 1,000 <laughs> IU of HCG that I don't take. Um, so I just take the testosterone. <laughs> the impulse. Paul really, Paul really picks and chooses. Um, so here's kind of another way to go about this, looking at this. It might not be that she's talking about HRT from a uh, testosterone, HCG, yeah. and astral. She might be talking about it from a thyroid aspect. And in that scenario, I can definitely see some body fat implications, right? Sure. Oh, and real quick, before we move on to that, um, I think like probably with like older males, like you do see claims of them them saying anecdotally that they have been able to maintain like lower body fat levels once they start HRT and stuff. Like my levels were low um, at an earlier age, so I qualified for TRT, but they weren't like, you know, old as fuck low. You know, what um, what do you what I mean? What do you chalk that up to? Is it? you know, general well-being, training quality, moving around more? Because you often hear older men report that they just feel very lethargic. They don't move around as much. They're not as motivated to train. Do you think that is the, the biggest piece there when it comes to maintaining a lower body fat? I mean, I think it depends. You know, like if you – if your like testosterone is 100 or less and, and you – multiply that times like eight to 10, I mean, probably you're going to get some, some solid body composition improvements, but uh, yeah, I would assume like your energy levels would go up, uh, potentially. And then you may even just have that, that psychological motivation of like, Oh man, like I can get something out of this. If I start training or start training more, take my diet more seriously. And you know, a, a lot of older guys probably sort of, you know, look back at when they were younger. They're like, man, I wish I looked like that again. And, you know, kind of think. Have, of you, guys seen, a, have you guys seen the research that kind of looked at the psychology there where they like told people that they were on steroids and they were giving them like glucose tablets. They told them that they were on like D ball and they were giving them like glucose tablets. And they made and, great gains. Yeah. They made like amazing gains. Like they actually gave them drugs for a little while and then stopped giving them drugs. And we're like, Oh, you know, we're still giving you drugs here. And they were like, hell yeah. And they just kept getting stronger. And the folks that were like, you know, we're going to stop giving you drugs. They were like, Oh, we're not on it anymore. And they dropped off. So uh, I like that, that psychology of it. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, Dom, you want to, you want to take this from a, from a thyroid route? Cause that's, is that pretty much the like extent of HRT? It's either kind of the Hormone. test route or the thyroid route. I mean, sometimes some doctors anything. will prescribe growth hormone um, yeah, true. or other drugs that uh, will uh, augment like growth hormone release. Yeah, I'm trying to think about. Uh, and they, then they, they all prescribe kinds of hypermorphin a lot. Yeah, I am yeah. my. Uh, my clinic has mentioned that they do some of the GHRPs too. Um, and then a lot of those clinics get into all kinds of like random things like, like injectable carnitine and injectable vitamins and all of that glutathione. So Dom, from a thyroid perspective, I mean, is it, this theory probably holds a little bit 100%. more. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on HRT for my thyroid. I had high, I have hypothyroidism, and the second I fixed my thyroid, it was like I was a new person. <laughs> well, what, what do you mean by that? What, was, time. <laughs> what uh, what really changed for you when you started HRT for the thyroid stuff? Certain like calorie benchmarks, like calorie intakes that would get me softer, weren't things like that. I felt a big difference in. And then actually yesterday, somebody at the gym was talking to me about, he was like, man, what happened? Like, he goes, you changed a lot over the past, like, two, three years. And I said, I think fixing my thyroid was the number one thing. I, said, I, I was like, I went in and got tested when I should have, because, like, you know, thyroid stuff is really hereditary. 
and my mom has Graves' disease or had Graves' disease. My brother has Hashimoto. So both, uh, both thyroid issues, I should have been tested. I just never got it done until, until after my second show in 2018. And then from there, I got on hormone replacement thyroid meds. And then uh, from there, it was just like total different body composition all the time. I could maintain like high calories without putting on as much body fat. What about your energy levels? Uh, I know I wasn't as tired as fast. Like yeah. I could like stay up longer throughout the day. Um, Cause I have a, a female client that it seemed like she was kind of struggling to lose body fat. She was already on um, thyroid hormone replacement. I was looking at some of her blood numbers and she like mentioned a bunch of fatigue and I was like, well, like, I feel like these blood markers, like they're, they look pretty good, but I feel like they could be better. Can you talk to your doctor and see what he thinks and see like, if he's willing to like try out a, a slightly higher dose. And she talked to him and he was, she felt a lot better, like throughout her day, like had more energy. And it seemed like it did translate to her being able, when she went into a deficit, just things going a little more smoothly as well. Dom, you're a really data heavy guy. So I'm interested to hear this. When you talk about there are certain calorie thresholds where you can like maintain your body weight, what was the difference in like a pre and a post there? Was it like a 10% difference, a 15% difference, or was it smaller? No, I, I'd say probably closer to like 15, almost 20%. Holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I couldn't, I would start getting soft at like body weight times like 13. Now I can like eat and maintain pretty well at like 16. And then if I'm really pushing training and everything, like I can get up to body weight type 17 and just stay there and maintain. Like right now I'm maintaining at my body weight type 17. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're, you're carrying a lot more muscle now as well, which I'm sure is helping quite yeah, a bit. Helps, of course. Um, something that's, that's you know, thyroid hormone destroys muscle, so. It does, <laughs> it does. It wastes it all away. Just goes in there like a flamethrower and just incinerates it. I'll probably be looking at thyroid replacement soon because I've been told based on like my numbers that it's coming eventually because my TSH keeps creeping up. But uh, yeah, I feel like I feel like it's coming around the corner because I'm noticing I'm needing to eat less over time to maintain my body weight. But I'm like also bigger like that shouldn't really be happening, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think if, if this is a. Uh... A topic that really piques your interest. I know. I know. Dom has a has an HRT lecture either queued up or already in the mentoring lab about you know thyroid hormone and whatnot. So definitely find your way over there for a little bit more of an expansive lecture. So I got a question for all three of you. Somebody made this argument that hormone replacement is still an advantage because you don't go through normal circadian rhythm with the day like if like a male taking a testosterone shot doesn't have the natural peak and valleys that natural testosterone has every single day so you're you're still you, there's still like an added benefit to hormone replacement even though your levels are still technically natural potentially i mean i think on paper in theory it's there but like how much does it practically um, work out to, and especially when we're talking about, you know, like, yeah, maybe if we're talking about a change within an individual, like you go from 200 or 100 nanograms per deciliter to 800, 900, 1,000, like, yeah, but that that's not from stable levels. That's just from getting a many times multiplier on the amount of testosterone you have in your body. And then also one thing I would question, let's say, you could know for sure it was equal, right? Like, so let's say uh, a male produce X amount of testosterone on their own, um, you know, at whatever points throughout the day, and then you had a male supplement the same dose over a week, like your, your exposure to milligrams should be fairly equal. So like, ultimately, like, will you be that much bigger even though you have more stable coverage? I think that mm -hmm. fluctuations in that normal range are probably not that. I think Greg Knuckles did like a whole video or article about this, about fluctuations think, within that physiological range. And the I argument that was, he made there was like 
you know, whether you're at 400 or whether you're at 900, because you're within that normal range, one person there doesn't really have an advantage over the other. I, I'd have to go back and look. It, it was actually uh, Lane Norton, and I think there might have been a oh, sub okay. article on it. And uh, I, I think he he misinterpreted some research. It, the study he cited, <laughs> like the study, huh? <laughs> Jay goes surprise. <laughs> uh, it, it was a study where they used like twenty five, fifty, one hundred and twenty five. And then um, 300 and then maybe 600 milligrams of testosterone or something. He, I have to go back and look at what the misinterpretation was. But I remember seeing that and being like, that that wasn't a good uh, interpretation. But um, I, wonder, I wonder if in the natty bodybuilding scene, if like, you know, the true standouts there, like the Iron Lords of the world, that's his IG. Inst- I honestly don't know what his real name is. <clears throat> I know it's something insane. Garino so, is- Mackey. Yes, that. So, so if he's like some like testosterone outlier where he's like way up on the higher end or, you know, if there's other some other explanation as to why he's just there could be other explanations, man, because so this is where like within the natural range, like, yeah, if you go from 400 to 800 within an individual, like probably not a huge difference. And no matter who you are, 800 nanograms per deciliter, like, isn't enough to, like, just make you a fucking monster, right? But if you go from 100 or sub 100 to 8 or 900, like, you definitely will notice a difference in your physique. Like, yeah. um, and then also, like, when, when I was on the, I, that was my experience. I was, like, roughly um, two, 300. And, you know, they brought me up to around 700, give or take. And from a muscle building standpoint, it really didn't seem like I got much out of that during that duration. More so maybe just fat storage pattern a little bit over time, like a like a year or something. My friend I'm Bart sure was like that natural 1100 test. <laughs> so oh, I'm sure there's a big difference because there's like guys, I mean, on the natural side it's uh neon niang babakar is the guy that like he should yeah oh, he's yeah. like old, uh, I, old, I believe he's a, i think he's italian um but he just gets on stage but he's a black guy which is very strange i don't know how that all works they, they out those? <laughs> i don't know how we got there but uh <laughs> you know it's uh, he's uh he's one of those guys where he gets on stage next to everybody else who are clearly you know, outliers and he gets on stage and you realize like, oh, so there's an outlier to the outliers. He just looks like a different type of human being altogether. And whenever I look at him, I'm like, you know, you have that question of like, so he passed some drug tests. So it, maybe he's just good at passing the test, but he just looks very different. I don't know if it's a, it's a combination of, you know, he's an outlier when it comes to hormone levels. He's an outlier when it comes to how small his joints are. He's an outlier when it comes to muscle bellies, just like all of those he, things all together. Is he one of those motherfuckers that looks insane? And then you look at his stage weight and you're like, you're 145 pounds. Like what? No, like, dude, he's like, <laughs> he's like five, not, which isn't huge, but I think he's like five, nine, 185 or something like that, which in the natural community, like that's pretty big. 185 um, on stage in the natural community is like basically Ronnie Coleman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like even like the the more well known natural body, like like but Berto, he's, I think he's five nine. He's like one sixty five on stage or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's uh, he's a different human. Ne- look him up, Neon Niang Babakar. Yeah. yeah, just Google, just type that on in. However you however you feel. He's also and, one of those weird dudes that does like backflips on stage, kind of like Greeno, Matt, where you're like, oh, you have a ton of just, you're like a fast twitch dominant human being. Like you're just a different person altogether. Shout outs to slavery for that, actually, now that I think about it. Um, oh, and what you're saying, Ryan, about that other dude, you're like, maybe it's something else. Uh, but, uh, you know, like even with my lower testosterone, like I wasn't like a bodybuilding prodigy. But I looked pretty good for a natural, you know, like people would come up to me and be like, oh, you're not on anything like <laughs> fuck you, Ryan. <laughs> uh, but no, like I, I looked pretty good as a natural. So there definitely are other factors outside of just testosterone levels. And I remember I, I went to one doctor even 
um, to try to get HRT, and he did a hormone, a full hormone panel on me, and it was the first time I got my IGF-1 tested, and he was like, I've never had anybody in this office come in here with IGF-1 so high, you know? Oh, high score. Put my name on the wall. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's cool. And he was like, <laughs> then he refused to give me TRT because I was still pretty jacked. Like, like when you eat the two-pound cheeseburger and Paul just on the doctor's wall holding up his blood work, and it just says, like, Paul, <laughs> Serafini, highest IGF ever. <laughs> All right, let's let's hit this next question. Michelle, if you have any expansions on that question, you know where to find me. Um, this next question is from at the Joel effect, the Joel underscore effect. Uh, Joel, I'm assuming that's his name, is says, what are some bodybuilding staple foods that you say are detrimental? So what are some foods that you most often see bodybuilders eating that could possibly be detrimental, unhealthy, I, I guess, is the question here? Uh, I like that question. Bro broccoli. Why do you say broccoli? What's wrong with broccoli, dude? I eat broccoli every day. Because I get people that are like, oh, my, my stomach hurts all the time, and I can't shit, and I'm always bloated, and yada, 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 and I'm like, or what do you eat? I eat broccoli. Oh, well, take out the broccoli and let's see how you feel and they feel better. So I'm going to go with broccoli. Broccoli <laughs> it is. I got one. Um, not detrimental from like a health standpoint, but a, uh, I guess, goals and adherence standpoint. I see a lot of people dieting and eating fucking rice cakes. And that's like styrofoam air. What's wrong with rice I cakes? I love styrofoam rice cakes. Rice cakes it's great. Right. Huh? They're delicious. Yeah. No, they are delicious. But like, like you're fucking four weeks out, and that's gonna be your fucking carb source. Yeah, man, dude, it is. that that's like the best way to like stay oh, hungry. Detrimental doesn't mean I don't like it, <laughs> <laughs> dude. It's like the best way to fucking stay hungry. There's so many other carbs you could eat that would fill you up more. Like what? I don't know. A slice of fucking bread. <laughs> Uh, pumpkin, a fucking potato, pumpkin. What the fuck are you <laughs> up with? <laughs> I ate so so during my prep, I ate a can of canned pumpkin one one day, and it was the nastiest thing I've ever eaten. It tastes like baby food. I tried. I tried to make something. I, I just kept putting shit in it. I'm like, all right, some stevia has got to make it better. And like, I was like, all right, a little bit of milk. Okay, we'll, we'll throw some oats in it, it some protein it in powder. Pan. I put it in a pan and put like cinnamon and stevia. It was disgusting. I just got <laughs> I already started eating it. I have to finish it. Dom, your mic is doing weird stuff, but yeah, I think it's that. I think it's your mic telling you to please stop talking. Like, what I'm super curious about is like, did you take the can opener out and you were like, yes, like it's canned pumpkin time. Get my spoon ready. <laughs> time to enjoy this. Like, have you had pumpkin otherwise? It's pretty fucking gross. I think it is that. Pretty gross. I th I think I was under the false assumption that I could get it to make it taste like pumpkin pie, and it like not have a lot of calories, and then. I knew that pumpkin was incredibly filling. Yeah, I mean, think, I think with enough Splenda and cinnamon, you probably could have made it taste relatively similar. <laughs> I don't know. Two pumpkin didn't. pie? Oh. Um, all right, let's go back. How's my mic? Oh, it's perfect. Dom, I actually find that same issue with a lot of my clients who are going, reaching for like the super like heavy, starchy uh, green vegetables. Like people over consuming broccoli, asparagus, celery, shit like that. Yeah. Is it what is it called? Raffinos? That's the sugar that's hard to break down. Uh is it? Yeah. Raffinose is in beans. It's a complex sugar found in cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, asparagus, and some whole grains. And like some people don't have the enzyme to break it down or something like that. I think it's technically so it's, it's probably technically a cellulose, right? It's like a fiber. Yeah, it's like uh it's like yeah. It's a starch fiber. It's probably insoluble fiber, right? I would say. Uh we're doing our research. All right. 
other gentleman. Did, Jay, you didn't even get in with your food that's either detrimental or that you hate because apparently that, those are the two directions that we're going here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's you see, detrimental. I, I think, and this is, oh, this might be a hot take. I think that, and I don't even know if you can call it a food, but I think you can call it a food. So whey protein shakes while in prep, deep in prep, I think could be uh, psychologically detrimental because it doesn't make you full at all. You're just drinking okay. calories and some Fuck people- mine. My, okay. mine was probably for the same reason. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I think like that's definitely something where if somebody's in prep, I'm like, instead of having that shake that you've just felt like you needed to, to drink forever, because like, that's part of your- you know, bodybuilders are very, uh, uh, they're very routine like this. I drink this shake at this time because I'm a bodybuilding robot. And so they're like, I have to drink this shake. I'm like, and they're hungry. I'm like, why don't you just have a meal instead? Why don't you have some chicken or something like that? And then you maybe you might not be as hungry at that time. But then I've also got another question. Um, and this is just because Paul and I have a disagreement on pepperoni and sausage. And now I have another question for you, Paul. The question is this. Uh, sweet potato pie or pumpkin pie? Where are you at? I'll be honest, man. For a long time, I I uh, was an against sweet potato pie because I hadn't had it and it just sounded weird. And I was very familiar with pumpkin pie. But this last year, I had some sweet potato pie, and I think it. I I don't know if it's the who or where it was made by, but I think sweet potato pie might be a little better than pumpkin pie. Okay. Okay. Uh, who who or who or where did it come from? I just bought. That's the thing. I I just bought like I oh, saw. I uh, got it like Walmart or something. No, I walked by Walmart and I saw one that was this big, <laughs> and I was like, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. <laughs> Fuck it. You know, I got a fat kid moment, and then I had it, and I was like, that was pretty damn good. And then the next time I was in Publix and I saw like a big one, I was like, Fuck it, right? Like, oh, this is why this is play that conversation back. I said this guy probably got it at Walmart. You said nah. So I was at Walmart when I saw this sweet potato pie. Because there's more to it than that, dude. You can't just that that's not the end of the fucking story. <laughs> Dom, sweet potato pie or pumpkin pie? Sweet potato pie. I, I think there's a lot of like interpretations on sweet potato pie. So what is what's like the classical preparation? Because I've seen it done so many so many different ways. What? Yeah, I think I've if only you put seen one kind of pie. Some people put nuts on it, and I would like to nuts. say, uh, fuck those people. Um, mm -hmm. Who wants to change text? Why would you put nuts on? <laughs> 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 Because down here at Walmart, we put our nuts on every pie. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, you you have to put a, a little marshmallow. I think that's that's a decent interpretation of this. I think that or whipped cream is pretty solid. Whipped cream is solid. Whipped cream? No, you got to put whipped the marshmallow cream is delicious, on top and you got to brown them. You got to, what is that? Dude, shit whipped like, cream is fucking delicious, or something? dude. Whipped cream is disgusting. Disgusting. That's stupid. What? Yeah, I feel like poor man's mark to say that is if you've never had it. I, I, I I'd rather eat. I'd rather eat Cool Whip. <laughs> cool, I, same. I'm right both, there with you. They taste like the fucking same, basically. No, dude, it's a texture thing. A cool Whip has more to it than whipped cream. Whipped cream is just like air, and it just like gets in my mouth and like does. I don't even know weird <laughs> stuff. Delicious. Does some of this action? I don't like it. Cool Whip like is it just harder to work with. Joel, are you happy? Are you happy with the direction you've taken us down? You've gotten very little actual <laughs> advice, and it's mostly just been us telling you what uh, foods we don't like. Here's a food that, that I get. I I'm gonna piggyback off Jay. I don't know if this actually counts as a food, but like carb powder. People who use like carb powders during prep, like all right, you know, got to get my 60 grams of cyclic dextrin during my workout when they have like 90 grams of carbs for the day. Like, enjoy the rest of your day, man. It's gonna be a rough one. It's gonna be a hungry one. And I was just thinking about like, even when, I don't know, whenever we made that switch from eating, quote unquote, remember there was a time where you would tell somebody like they were stupid if they ate, quote unquote, clean. And it, it had, if it fits your macros, bro, that was the only, like you eat pop tarts and shit. And you could prep oh, on pancakes. Clean? What do like, you like? Put bleach on your food first? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, and I just think about basically every single one of those foods are probably detrimental to a bodybuilding prep because a pop tart sure tastes delicious and it may be awesome if you're one of those weirdos that could diet on a shit ton of carbohydrates because your activity level is just so high. But if you're just a regular person that's dieting and your carbs are low and you've decided that you would like to eat two pop tarts as your only carbohydrate source, that's not a good move. Yeah. Not at all. Your mic's yeah. Going. yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that's coming from. Bear with us as we handle these. Oh, looks like some weird feedback or something. All right, everybody mute yourself. All right, let's see if it's Dom. Oh, I think we found our culprit. I think it was Dom. Dom, put him, unmute yourself, Paul. Yeah, uh, uh, Jay, talk. You got yourself muted. You can't talk when you're muted. <laughs> I think Dom was fucking it up for everybody. I messed up the instructions. Like that's Man, unbelievable. The guy with, with 42 computer screens, but zero. You to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Please don't. Please. No, I, Jay, you bring up a good point. I think people got super wrapped up in what they can do during a contest prep, and they weren't worried about as much what they should be doing. You can attack a police officer. You probably should not attack a police officer probably not the same as eating pop tarts during prep but a parallel that you know you can maybe uh draw some value from joel has your question been answered i think it has is uh is my mic better yeah sounds pretty good now it like comes and goes in waves but it's sounding pretty good right now and your traps those who aren't watching on youtube dom's traps right now punishing punishing t-shirt you gotta overcompensate now and fucking really <laughs> neck gang. No neck gang. All right. Our next question comes from at oh man. Jacob and Chile. Ch Jacob and Chile. Jacob and Chile. Jake. That's it. That's what you're getting. What uh, if his Jacob. name is Jocko Ben Ile? Jocko Ben Jocko Ben Isle. Like the Dude, how many Ben's interactions life. do we get from people who are upset that we butchered their name? How dare you butcher my weird Instagram tag, you, you don't know what happens to those gems. All right, Jacob, or Jacob, or Yako. Uh, what is considered too much volume in a week for a specific muscle group? 16 sets. All right, let's three. move it on to the next question. Oh, Jay's going, Jay's going three. He's going very Dorian Yates hit style. Anything over three sets is too much. Paul, you're the you're you're the guy who who talks about this stuff a lot. That that training fella. What do you think? What do you classify as too much? I'd probably say like if if you just notice like you're consistently um, under recovered from session to session or a certain number of sessions like a week depending on your frequency um or finding yourself needing to like maybe deload too frequently or something like that probably probably too much volume and then you know just the standard volume recommendations are are about the the upper end of what's typically recommended for most people is about 20 sets a week per body part yeah, I think those are good metrics right there. When you're when you're when you first start working with a client, is this something that you explore where you kind of like slowly work it up and see what they can tolerate? Or do you pretty much just hang out within those accepted ranges? So usually when I have a new client, I'll start them off somewhere, depending on the muscle group, uh, 10 to 15 sets per body part, roughly. Uh, and then when and then maybe back because the back is a little more complex, maybe working up to close to maybe 20 ish. Um, but on specialization phases, that's where I'll take like a body part or two and gradually push up volume and see if something like that happens. And if something like that happens for a couple phases in a row, 
uh, that's where I'll, I'll back off a little bit and give them like let either less frequency or, or less volume, depending on how I want to manipulate that volume. A question for the group is volume tolerance or the threshold of volume where an individual responds the best to training. Is that something that changes significantly over the course of someone's career? Like, does someone's ability to tolerate volume go up, thus they need more to elicit adaptation? Does it work in the opposite direction? What is uh, what is your take there? I have a take, but I already talked, so if somebody else wants to go. Um, I think from, at least anecdotally, I'll say that the amount of volume that I could do when I was younger um, was just a lot higher. And that's even been as of lately, like recently. So there was a time like when Ryan, when Ryan and I first met, I think I was doing like maybe 20 plus sets per muscle group. And I would spend oh, like yeah. multiple hours because I had to, you had to. Like, <laughs> and now, and that was just, it was just a, that was due to just far too much information. That's when we were all learning far too much shit and we were applying everything all at the same time. So I just thought more volume equals more progress. Um, and then over time, that's just decreased. And now, I mean, I'm probably towards 10 ish sets per muscle group, sometimes even eight. But I think that's also because the quality of work now is just better. And I think that the people that need a ton of volume, often when I really look at what they're doing, I'm like, oh, you can do less volume. It's just your technique sucks. Like you're just not very good. And the target muscle isn't being stimulated as much. But if you slowed things down a little bit, dropped a little bit of load, hey, now, took a little, worked a little bit more on your technique, then you could possibly get away with less volume. And that, I mean, to me, that seems the way to... The way to go about it because you're spending less time in the gym. Um, I'll get somebody and they're like, oh, I'm doing 25 sets per week. And then I'll go, okay, let's let's go back down to 10. Let's just see what happens here. And then I'll have them back their volume down. They kind of balk at me for a little bit like, oh, I don't know, bro. And then I'll have them do things right. And they're like, man, I was real sore um, just from changing tempo a bit, just from working on execution a bit. And now I'm making progress again with less volume. So for me, that's always, I, I think that it it possibly works the other way. Like you might need less volume over time as you kind of really hone in technique. And it's Dumb. even stronger. That's the other Dumb. When you were doing your like one, like true top set to failure kind of style of training that you were doing there for a little while, um, were you doing less volume then than you are now? Or are you doing uh, oh, more yeah. volume? Okay. Less. And I barely grew. So oh, I see Mike again. All right, who wants to answer for Dom? All right, so yeah, yeah, I was doing significantly less volume. Uh, here we go. Maybe, maybe. Maybe it's a little better. Maybe, not quite yet. But when you switch over, possibly. How about now? Oh my God, it's great! Wow, that was beautiful. There we go. The difference. So I was doing way less volume. <laughs> um, and I wasn't. I didn't grow at the rate I did now, so it was probably too low. What do you what do you estimate like working sets per week that you were doing at that point? What was probably I mean probably less, less three or ten. four? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because because your training style back then was kind of like work up to that big top set, hit a very stimulating failure set there, and then move on to the next exercise, right? Kind of yeah. like what uh kind of like what trained by JP either used to advocate for or still advocates for maybe. He still advocates for it, but uh. I followed his training for a while uh, and then it would be like work up to one top set, maybe a second. If the, if you did a second working set, it was a back off set. Uh, but that was rare. It was only the, there'd be like a second back off set on like accessories, never a compound. Uh, but it, I thought I thought it was just too low, even though it's really stimulating, like you're fried after. But. I just didn't feel like it was enough volume. I think the pressure there to make that one set count, if you know you only have that one set, it's probably a lot of pressure to get the absolute most out of that set. I feel like I would be really second guessing myself. Like, hmm, did I really get the most that I could have out of that one single set? And maybe that's what drove this like refractory kind of opinion of like okay well then let's spread all of that stimulus out over eight sets per movement 
and, you know, drive our MRVs up to 45 sets per week for traps or these insane numbers that you heard. Yeah, I, I think I, I think you can handle less volume as you as your training age goes up just because you get better at movements, you get more efficient at doing things. That'd be my opinion on it. Like, I don't think like my chest responds at lower volume markers than it used to. And it's probably just because I'm getting better at the movements, better at mind to muscle connections and things like that. Cause like, I don't need, I don't even think I hit, I probably hit 10 or 11 or 12, maybe 10 to 12 sets a week on my chest. You know, blow some people's minds here. <laughs> yeah. What if, um, like, I'll look at people's data. <clears throat> I'll look at a client's data, and if they're doing, let's say they're doing three sets on one exercise or four sets on one exercise with a, a specific weight, I'll kind of pay attention to where their performance starts to fall off. So if it's like, you know, 100 pounds for 10, 100 pounds for 8, and then 100 pounds for 3, I'm like, whoa, like, that's a giant drop-off, and maybe, just maybe, that's how much volume either you can handle on that specific exercise. And I'll kind of make adjustments based off of that. Cause you want to keep your performance high. And I'll also address like rest periods and things like that. But, um, I think that could maybe, I don't know if there's any literature that suggests that at all, but I think that can maybe be an indicator of how much volume you can tolerate, especially per session. Yeah. So I think like what you can tolerate, um, is like, that's different than, what you can benefit from or the most that you can probably benefit from or make your best progress at, you know, because you can probably train yourself to tolerate a lot more fucking volume than like at least what us bodybuilders in the chat are doing right now. I don't know about you, Ryan, with the craziness that you do, but <laughs> I mean, my sport is just doing as much volume as <laughs> yeah. I can as fast as possible. Yep, yeah, so you, you're probably near the upper limit already. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my, uh, like, my lats agree right now. <laughs> but um, no, I completely agree with everyone, uh, you know, assuming that you get smarter and better and more effective at your training, that your volume probably goes down. But there are points where it probably your volume needs probably go up, you know, and that's just because, you know, going from when you're untrained, almost anything causes adaptation, then probably, you know, you become a little more trained. So that goes up a little bit. And then maybe over a training career. In theory, like if you train the same, it, it probably goes up, but like not as much as people think. And like you said, you guys have said it's offset by just getting better at program design and execution and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, when I was and then the age thing, going back to. Um, you know what you said, I, I also feel like I could tolerate more volume when I was or yeah tolerate more volume when i was younger but i think a lot of that just came down to me ignoring the signs that i needed to do less volume you know what i mean like just being young and stubborn and thinking you needed to do it and so you literally just train yourself to tolerate the volume even though there's probably not any further benefit and when we talked about it on the gnn which will be up on on mondays moving forward but it's like that very like machismo attitude of like i'm willing to die for this so like i'll do like you know 50 sets of preacher 50 sets of concentration curls if that's what it takes and it's like this having to take a step back and be like okay you know we know that you can do that the human body physically can perform that it's more of an issue of what can you benefit from, not just tolerate, like you said, Paul. Yeah, I actually, I did a lecture on this in the Mentoring Lab podcast where I pulled up like an old photo of me from like, I think eight years ago now, um, a, a little natty photo, and I talked about the volume that I did then, and then the volumes that I worked up to eventually, like years later, and then now I'm back down doing similar volume that I was doing seven or eight years ago. You know, um, and, you know, sometimes it's just how it works. Like, I don't think your volume needs really go up that much over years. Probably when you're already don't advanced. need as much as you think. And it's funny to see the, the RP folks, the ones who talk about volume the most, kind of retreating on some of their more aggressive uh, recommendations. It's always funny to watch, like, the trends and the ebbs and the flows of how the evidence-based folks change over time. And, and see if that kind of 
goes back up because these things they like kind of wave up and down and high volume oh no you can get it with lower volume full body every day super low volume oh no maybe you know we do some splits and we really ramp the volume up so interested to see what that next uh spike of popularity is yeah i'll be honest too man i uh, I in that same uh, mo- uh lecture honestly i sort of feel like if you can do more than 10 sets for an individual muscle in a in a training session like you're you're probably fucking around and honestly <laughs> i feel like i feel like it like with focus good training at three rir or less like you should be able to in five sets or less be like wow that muscle feels pretty damn trained right now like i did something for that muscle and i think it's a weird thing where like we're all trying to get you know it's like do more volume so i can make more progress today you need to make more progress like you just need to (laughs) you need to get there in the next two weeks like what are we talking about here like what if you just did less better volume but you still got there but it took like two weeks longer so I mean, it's like, wh- what are we after here? Like, what's going on? Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I and there's an argument that probably you could get where you're going with less volume. Like, if you're doing too much, when you do less and you do it better. <laughs> I think people, well, uh, I think people don't like to pay attention to the signs because then it means they work out less or they do less in the gym. It's not, it's not as like mentally stimulating. Like, this isn't fun. Like, I was telling somebody the other day, like, you don't need to squat to get big legs. Like, you could use a hack squat, you could leg press, you could do so many other things. And he's like, yeah, but, like, there's nothing better than barbell squatting. And I said, sure, but, like, (laughs) if you want to actually grow, like, you have to take a step back. And maybe it's not as enjoyable, but we're in the gym for, you know, for that reason, to put on muscle, to, you know, do that. But you can't like i feel like people just don't want to sacrifice the fun aspect which they think is fun like doing five sets of bicep curls versus like you could just do two and it would probably be enough that's a weird statement there's nothing better than barbell back squat (laughs) what what does that even what's that supposed to mean that's an ego thing dude um it's crazy because I feel like I felt that way. I don't know if it's an age thing or an age in the activity thing, but now like the, all of, none of that sounded fun to me being in the gym for a long time, back squatting. Like now what's fun to me is like trying to figure out like, Hey, can I train the fuck out of this muscle in five sets or less and not be here for two hours? Like, (laughs) but I think it's a little bit of it's from that. God, I hate harping on, power building but some of it i think comes from that still where people think they have to squat and they have to deadlift and everybody benches i mean let's be honest who doesn't bench press i mean but like i it took me forever to give up on sumo deadlifts because i thought for sure that's how i was going to get a bigger lower but just a bigger overall body because that's what sumo deadlifts work your entire body at the same (laughs) everything even like your ears get worked from sumo deadlifts full body movement yeah (laughs) Yeah. And I thought for sure, I just recently gave, gave up back squatting because it would just, it would kill my hips so much. So I went to front squats and I'm like, oh, okay, this makes a little bit more sense for someone that's built like a giraffe. Oh yeah. yeah. For all the giraffes out there. All right. Last question of the day comes from Omar, the underscore Omar Rivera. I'm going to read the question as written and then I'm going to reword it. Uh, is covering yourself up during prep build more muscle? I don't know. Is it? Does covering yourself up? You know, maybe I copied and pasted it wrong, and Omar's gonna be like, Ryan, you're a real asshole for that. Uh, does covering yourself up during prep build more muscle, specifically while doing the stairmaster? Obviously, it's a satirical question here, but let's dig into kind of some of the psychology behind why people do feel the need to quote unquote cover up while they're prepping. While they're in a contest prep, I don't fucking understand it. I think they like being sweaty. What maybe is their? The maybe they've got a new like discount code for some new like deodorant out there, and they're putting it to its you, test. You know what I like think, getting man? Sweaty as shit. I'll tell you what I think. You did all that work for nothing. Just blew it all, wasted it. Nobody gets to enjoy it. Not even you. Yeah, because oh, there's nothing, nothing better than the end of prep 
you're just looking like an absolute sick mofo at the gym. All the girls look at you. What do they say? That's disgusting. All the guys, <laughs> they look at you. What do they say? Damn, dude, I'm trying to smash. So if that's your goal, you're trying to get smashed by mad dudes or you're trying to smash mad dudes, then peel that pump cover off, brother. Exactly, Show dude. everyone what you're working with. Show us those fire hose veins that you got running down your forearms. All right. But in all, in all honesty, what, what might be some of the reasons why people cover up during a contest perhaps to hide maybe, themselves from competition? Maybe they're tired of dudes coming up to them and asking to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe. That's what I thought when I saw the five percenter dude at uh, Europa. I saw his arms and I was to like, I was thinking in my head, like, I want to touch it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Jay, Dom, any explanation <clears throat> here? Um, the first thing I want to go with is that it's cold. Uh, I don't know about you guys when you prep, but I am not warm most of the time. Luckily, I live in Florida where it's warm basically all the time. But uh, sometimes, I mean, you go to a gym and it's just cold. So I would stay covered up. But then eventually, I'd strip down to uh, just my posing trunks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you're cold, you could do that. And I remember there was definitely a times you watch some of those like 90 bodybuild, 90s uh, bodybuilding films, and they all were basically covered up for a lot of the time. Like if you watch a a Dorian video, he was covered up. Um, Kevin Lavroni, I think that's how you, do you pronounce that. Lavroni, like pepperoni. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Same. Thing. Um, but yeah, those guys would stay. They would stay covered up, and I would, I would do that for a little bit. But I don't understand why. Do we get to the second part of that question? Probably thermodynamics. They, you know, they're probably burning more fat because they're hot. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to heat Burning up the body. Fat is hot. Burning fat have to be hot. <laughs> Paul loves we, that. He's dropping a heart this? react. Did we get to the stairmaster section? No, hit that stairmaster section, sir. Get after it. But then the second part of his question was specifically while doing the stairmaster, and I feel like Omar might be taking some direct shots at some people at his gym, possibly. Um, but I used to do that where I'd wear, you know, I'd go to the gym. It was a separate session from my actual training session. I go to the gym in the morning to do cardio um, because that's how you do it. And I would be very covered up on the Stairmaster. And it had to have been, you know, you have to like drape yourself over the Stairmaster because that's what you do. And then you kind of just like keep, you keep your head down because it's the grind and you just, you know, you just step away. And that's how you're supposed to do it. Um you know, and that's probably why, Omar, because you just have to you have to live for this life. Um, and that's the only way you can really do it. You have to be fully covered, draped over the Stairmaster, because that's what makes you a bodybuilder. Nice. Jay, in your opinion, does it sound like Omar is about it or is Omar not about it? And he needs to step his game up a little bit because it seems like he's throwing shade at the people that are clearly about that life. And well above him in terms of the social hierarchy at your local LA fitness. Here is Sweater Stairmaster Man. And here's you down here, Omar. So if you want to level up, you gotta you gotta throw it on. Like Jay said, you gotta grind. I mean, how many pro cards does Omar have? How many plastic trophies does Omar have? You know, Omar, and you maybe pay Omar. the IFBB every single year just to get on stage and get that ass waxed at your pro debut no you don't so put the fucking sweater on and get to work brother <laughs> I, I did the elliptical for my whole prep i'm definitely wow, that's pathetic i'm definitely not about that life <laughs> get it together so here's a funny story so i too was about that sweater stairmaster life and you know how like the stairmaster has like the handles here, and then they run down the side, and then like down here there's like that little like platform where like what I would call Lake Squat Dad would form from all of my sweat dripping on there. I was such an insufferable piece of shit back then that I wouldn't even wipe that section down. And if anyone said anything to me, I would say, "Are you gonna touch that? Are you gonna put your hands on that right there? No, you're not. Then don't worry. About you're it. like, I know you're there, not. It'll dry. I know you're not because I don't even want to right now to fucking clean it. 
<laughs> so if I could go back, I would grab the nearest shower towel at my house and I would wipe down all of those Stairmasters at every LA fitness and zoo health club that I ever terrorized. I apologize to the Stairmaster, but I apologize to no one else. No. What about, uh, you know, I've noticed, uh, oof, I, I might catch some heat here, but I'm used to it. But what about bikini competitors on the Stairmaster? Have you noticed, what is the thing with the kick? Like you take a step, you have to swing your leg back or you have to do, you have to go sideways you know, if you're not glutes, watching bro. YouTube. Don't is ask. That what it is? Don't even ask, dude. I they're trying to, they're trying trying to wave and grab the attention of their father who stopped paying attention to them many, many years ago. <laughs> I had a... Uh, oh. I had a bikini oh. client ask me, uh, how do I save my, how do I keep my glutes from, you know, fading as I diet? And she's like, I do the Stairmaster every day for cardio. And I was like, well, that's a good way Don't to get rid that. of them. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing saps those sta- legs. When did the Stairmaster become like the only way to lose body fat? Like that's the only form. Of- <laughs> there was a time where it was like the only way to do it. I mean, it's fast. You can burn a lot of calories real quick, but your legs will hate you for it. I feel like there's a coordination quotient that involved that's involved with the stairmaster because I would fucking. There were times where I'd be in prep and I would just stumble through that thing like a dummy. I'd be like kicking it, and missing the step, and almost <laughs> dying on it every day, just almost falling off. Much. Yeah, I remember doing that quite a bit. You'd watch the TV for a second and watch like the cooking show. Like, oh, you know, it's another good episode of Chopped is on. Kick the stairs when your leg slips off. I was never a stairmaster guy. Like, I eventually became an elliptical guy. But early on, I think I just knew. Like, I walked in the gym and I saw that bike with the seat like this. And I'm like, that looks nice. (laughs) <laughs> like, you know, like <laughs> oh, it's really fucking nice. Like, <laughs> uh, I would, I'd get on the elliptical next to grandma every day, every morning. She'd be there, <laughs> and I would be right next to her. And it was, hi, honey. <laughs> yeah, dude, I, I mean, I, dude, I fucks with the elliptical heavily. That's just like it. Just seems like a very pleasant place to be. The elliptical. It's like you're moving your arms and your leg. You get a little rhythm going. It's nice. Yeah. I don't know. I enjoy it. When I was uh when I was probably like 14 years old, I went down to the Dick's Sporting Goods and I like did the thing where you stand on one side of the elliptical and you like pull yourself through <laughs> like this. And that I'm not gonna incriminate myself here, but that elliptical might have been broken and I might have run out of the store. Um, but I plead I, I the take fifth, both. plead the fifth, brother. I absolutely <laughs> plead the fifth. And if anyone from the uh, North Lake Boulevard Dick's Sporting Goods comes to my house, it was it wasn't me. Well, not me. Uh, anything else you want to say on the uh, covering up during prep? Doing the Stairmaster. Now, nah, Omar, your satirical questions are always appreciated. All right. Anything you want to leave the people with? Paul, we're going to have our Mayo rep discussion, sir. It's not going to be on this one, but it's going to be on one soon. So stay tuned the next time around. Paul and I are going to yell at each other, probably insult each other a lot. And then after 45 minutes of yelling at each other, we'll probably just be like, yeah, you know, I agree. That, that makes sense. Or it all just ends. Yeah. We go our separate ways. We never fucking talk again. Honestly, that might be the better outcome for both of us, okay. for, for both of our longevity. We might live longer and happier lives if we just avoid each other. Jay, Dom, anything to leave the people with? I go start gifted herb performance. <laughs> 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 yeah look for that brand coming soon <laughs> all right folks we will see you on the next one in the meantime do the youtube stuff like comment subscribe head on over to www.giftedperformance.com to apply for coaching just admire the website it's beautiful it looks a lot better look for that transformation tuesday post or the flash Fact friday post uh looking back at where the website was and everything that it wasn't and what it has come to today because of our lovely Jason Holt here. Uh, sign up for coaching, group coaching, all that good stuff. Mentoring Lab features these three gentlemen right here. We will see you on the next one. Until then, stay gifted. Everybody, I love you. Bye.